Hello, and welcome to the Three Links Oddcast, your podcast for all things having to do with Odd Fellowship. And now, here are your hosts. Welcome, everybody. This is the Three Links Oddcast. I'm one of your hosts, Toby Hansen. I'm your other host, Ainsley Heilick. And uh, you may be wondering where our third host is, Sergio. After having been on assignment with the Material Sciences Division for several months, he came back to us, but uh, he's had to take a little sabbatical from the show. Uh, one of his parents uh, had a health crisis, so he's taken a little time away from us and from all of you listeners so that he can tend to his parents, because after all, that's what we do as odd fellows and as Rebecca's. And speaking of Rebecca's, we have a wonderful guest. We are so honored to have Sister Elizabeth Maori Harbstreit here, who is the president of the International Association of Rebecca Assemblies. Welcome, Sister Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm happy to be with you. So for the benefit of our listeners, tell us a little bit about your story and your history here in Odd Fellowship. Well, it started on my 18th birthday, which was at that time the youngest age at which one could join the Rebecca's. My application for membership was presented into the Rebecca Lodge, which was named for my great grandfather. And I was initiated into that lodge two weeks later at the next meeting. And now that has been 51 years ago. Wow, and congratulations. I'm, I'm an old timer. In the intervening time, I served as president of the Rebecca Assembly of Missouri, presiding in 1982. At that point, I was the youngest president that the jurisdiction, well, and continued to be the youngest president who served in that point. And because of employment, I moved to Kansas some years ago and was active in Rebecca's there, being elected to the presidency of the Rebecca Assembly of Kansas when I presided in 2013. I retired, came back to Missouri, was re-elected president of the Missouri Assembly and presided in 2019. But before that, I had been elected warden of the International and have now advanced to the presidency. So I've been a Rebecca for a long time. Because of that, I have met Rebecca's and Odd Fellows literally from around the world and have developed wonderful friendships with people who, like you, who share the values that have been important to me for all these years. Well, thank you. That is a wonderful story. So to give you an idea, um, our average listener here is uh, a younger member, probably age 40 or under, and Good. almost exclusively odd fellows. And the reason we decided to do an episode about the Rebecca's is because I got a message on Instagram from Sister Savannah in Waxahachie Rebecca Lodge 381 in the jurisdiction of Texas. And she says, hey, I found your podcast. It's really great. I really like it. When are you going to do an episode about the Rebecca's? And so I talked to Ainsley and Sergio and said, hey, we've missed out on our Rebecca sisters. We need to do an episode. So with that in mind, uh, that the average listener here is a young odd fellow without necessarily a lot of experience in the order, what would you tell them about who the Rebecca's are and what they do? Rebecca's basically do the same things that odd fellows do. We share the same values. We, we frequently work with odd fellows, but not always because in some cases, we have Rebecca Lodges in places where we don't have Odd Fellows. The Rebecca's were founded as literally as the auxiliary to the Odd Fellows because the men could go to their Odd Fellows meetings, but 
What were the women going to do? There was nothing for them. And so in 1851, Schuyler Colfax wrote the Rebecca degree. It was adopted by the Sovereign Grand Lodge. And at that point, there, there was something for the wives, daughters, sisters of Oddfellows so that the, the linkage to odd fellowship was, um, was mandatory. We couldn't have just anyone joining Rebecca's. Happily, that requirement has been gone, I don't even know for how long, <laughs> because now anyone who is interested and is of good moral character, just like odd fellows, can join the Rebecca's, male or female. It, in, in some instances, we have um, Rebecca's, we have women only in lodges. In others, we have men and women with the men being very active. We have men, brothers who may or may not be members of the Odd Fellows. At one point, men could only join if they were first odd fellows. That's no longer true. And so it's um, membership now is, is open. It's available to those who share the beliefs that we hold. In many instances, the Rebecca's and the odd fellows work together, frequently sharing meeting places sometimes sharing meeting times in lodge facilities that have multiple meeting rooms. The Odd Fellows may be meeting in one room while the Rebecca's meet in the other concurrently and frequently share projects in states or in areas where, where one lodge does not exist then all of those interested join whatever lodge does exist there, whether it is Odd Fellows or Rebecca's. Does that help with where you wanted to go? Oh, absolutely. That yes, is, that was fantastic. That is probably one of the best expositions to the Rebecca's that I've ever heard. Well, thank you. <laughs> now we know how you got elected warden of the IARA. <laughs> well, when Toby pitched the idea of a Rebecca episode, I immediately was like, I know who is at the top of my list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sorry that that person wasn't available. <laughs> so I have to step in. You know, it was it was just too hard to make it work with the time zones in Atlantic Canada, and you know how that goes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned you mentioned 1851. That was when Schuyler Colfax wrote the Rebecca degree. So what what can you tell us about the the origins of of that and how it came about? Because uh, Every now and then I'm poking around in our Grand Lodge archives here in Washington, and I find one of the really, really old Rebecca charters um, from the days before Washington was a state when it was still a territory. And it, it was issued by the Grand Lodge, not by the mm -hmm. Rebecca Assembly. So what, what was sort of the, the original organizational structure of Rebecca Lodges? Think about society. The women were subordinates. The men held the property. The men held the authority. And so the odd fellows, made up solely of men, were being, I'm being a bit sarcastic here, but benevolent yeah. in giving the women this this time away from home and so on. <laughs> and so the, the charters were granted by the Grand Lodge because after all, the, the women did not have authority. And as time progressed, and good heavens, women got the right to vote. <laughs> That's the concept. And in that, 
in that development, and though I would say that we in the Independent Order of Odd Fellows were never at the cutting edge, we were a bit slow in making it happen, but but eventually when the Rebecca, the Rebecca assemblies were still chartered by the Grand Lodge, but now Rebecca assemblies frequently in jurisdictions have the authority to issue chapter or issue the charters to the Rebecca lodges. But we, we followed the path of society, but we followed it slowly not a statement of pride as you can hear <laughs> but you know the important thing is that even at the time even in the middle of the 19th century there were odd fellows who recognized that there was a need to have a female organization because that's something that you know looking at various other fraternal orders they've had various amounts of success and various experiences with chartering groups just for women and chartering auxiliaries and various things like that. I think that as Odd Fellows, we've actually had a great deal of success by first setting up the Rebecca degree and then organizing the Rebecca lodges and then eventually giving them the autonomy to be able to do things. Uh, like uh, there was a time when to open a Rebecca lodge, you had to have a third degree Odd Fellow present. Exactly, like the Masons requirement in Eastern Star. Exactly. It, and we, we were parallel. We are no longer. Yeah. And so we progressed even beyond some of those other groups that said, well, we, we need to keep a lid on those ladies. They might get a little crazy there. Let's make sure that there's a man present to make sure that everything is okay. We went way beyond that, you know. We, we trust our Rebecca's. We let them run their own business. You let us? <laughs> <laughs> do, do we need to talk here? <laughs> well, and in earlier times, the Rebecca's could not own property. Mm -hmm. mm. The property was owned only by the Odd Fellows. Now we have Rebecca Lodges who own their buildings. Yes. And our landlords with tenants, just like the Odd Fellows. But it, it took us time to get to that point. We have a wonderful Rebecca Lodge here in Washington, Cloverleaf number 54, which is in Bothell. And during my term as Grand Master, the Odd Fellows Lodge in that city was having problems. So I went in and helped them reorganize. And the Rebecca's were overjoyed at that because they were actually the owners of that building. They were the property managers and they, they were the ones running everything. So the thought of actually having a functional odd fellows lodge that could help out with things was a great idea to them. And that is actually one of those things. Um, we've had other lodges here in Washington where the Rebecca's have been the property owners. They've been the one who've owned things, managed it, done all of that work. And I've heard our former assembly secretary complain about having to do all the record keeping that goes along with that. <laughs> so I know it's true. Well, another example that is, is one which, for which I feel great pride is what the Rebecca's in California have done. Years ago, well, as, as you know, one of the tenets of our organization is to educate the orphan. And as many jurisdictions have had through time, we've, we've had orphanages and have done a variety of things in support of children in need. The California Rebecca's established a children's home, which was in fact an orphanage. I, if I remember correctly, it was in maybe the 1920s, but I, I'm, I'm not sure of that. But I, I, I say that as in it goes back a significant amount of time. Times have changed. The state and federal governments have established more um, 
requirements and such for orphanages and provided more support in, in foster care and care for children. Then the, the children's home in California has morphed away from orphanage, uh, although there are still some young people there in residential care, but it has morphed into a, a, an organization for dysfunctional families. Oh, wow. They have an on-site school that is uh, interactive with the public school, but it is on the children's home property. They provide a post um, post residential care when some some people some young people are coming out of the hospital setting from various reasons, not just critical illness. I don't mean that, but some for mental support. They can come to the children's home for. Uh, for that transition and ongoing support for mental health, not just for the young people, but as I said, working also with the family to, to build that family structure, to strengthen the structure for, for the benefit of the whole family. The Rebecca's did that. And now the board is... Uh, comprised of Rebecca's and Oddfellows or representatives from the Rebecca Assembly, the state organization, as well as the Grand Lodge, the state organization for the Oddfellows for the management of it. But, but it's a Rebecca project. The Rebecca's own the home. That's impressive. That's it's awesome. If you are ever in Gilroy, California, it is heartwarming to go and to see that this is not a new initiative. The, the home building itself is obviously a hundred years old or thereabouts, mm -hmm. but, but the, the, the other buildings are fresh and new and the place is vibrant. They have a culinary program that places their graduates in four-star restaurants. They have graduates wow. around the world. It, can you tell that I'm impressed and proud? They, it sounds like they, the board had amazing out-of-the-box foresight when the state took on a lot of the child welfare in the probably like the 60s, late 60s, it seems to be across the board when that happened. Mm -hmm. And they pivoted. And we're able to use that property for something that still met the needs of people in their, in their region there. And that's, and it's very successful because of that pivot. And um, so that's something that the entire organization can learn from is Absolutely. pivoting, pivoting wisely. Um, so that's uh, the, the fact that you mentioned that they the board has odd fellows and Rebecca's uh, I know in Illinois at our grand lodge level, a lot of our boards have to have an equal, yes. like three and three. And then there's like, if there's like a seven person board, there's like the seventh could be a wild card. Um, so kind of using that as a segue for kind of organization type nuts and bolts. Um, so our organizations, um, I'm also a Rebecca, but Good. speaking from the odd fellow side, um, it looks like kind of there's, they run a parallel ladder of chairs. It looks like. Um, as far as the structure, right, from the this, this, the lodge level, then the Grand Lodge or the Rebecca Assembly level, and then up to the um, the Sovereign or the IARA level. Um, In, so could you kind of explain a little bit of the, the, the process the, of the ladder there? The local organization is called a lodge, mm -hmm. whether it's Rebecca or Oddfellow. And the officers for the most part, are parallel. The presiding officer, the noble grand, the what would otherwise be a vice president is the vice grand, and then the secretary, the treasurer, 
and so on. There are some variances between Oddfellows and Rebecca's getting down into some of the, um, the functional ceremonial officers, but, but in terms of operation, they're parallel. Then in Rebecca's, frequently there are district organizations comprised of lodges in a geographical area. And so in a district, there may be three to five to seven of the local lodges that band together in this, this district structure, and they gather for some social events. They may have um, some some educational events where they, they come together. They may share uh, officers to help each other with, with installations or with initiations of new members. I don't know if that district structure is as strong in the Oddfellows now as it once was. Um, when I was growing up, I know our odd fellows had the district structure because my father was the district deputy grand master of our district for, oh my gosh, I don't know how many years. And it was a big deal when daddy was going to installation because he was, he was doing the installation. Anyway, so there, there may be that, that district structure. Um, others, other we call them jurisdictions, the state or provincial organization, or in some cases we have multiple states or states and provinces banding together for the jurisdiction. Some of the, the jurisdictions are small enough that they really don't have enough lodges to subdivide into districts. So they may have the north section and the south section that function about the same as the districts do in the larger jurisdictions. And then at the state level or the provincial level, that would be the Grand Lodge for Oddfellows or the Rebecca Assembly for the Rebeccas. And in the Rebecca Assembly, anyone who is a past noble grand can take the assembly degree to be qualified as an officer or a representative to function in the, the um, operational decisions of the assembly. Once we open in the assembly, however, and confer the degree, then we lower to the Rebecca degree so that any Rebecca can attend to see how the assembly functions but the, the ones who have not yet achieved past noble grand are, are not eligible to speak. They're there to, to learn. Mm -hmm. Then the assemblies have organized together to create the International Association of Rebecca Assemblies, which as you said, I am for which I am the president. And at this point we have I believe it's 46 assemblies that are members of the International Association. And um, when we meet for our, our annual meeting, each one of those assemblies is eligible to send one representative to, be, to make the governing decisions for the International Association. Wow, that sounds very, very similar to the Oddfellow structure right down to the district associations. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. You're basically doing the same things that we're doing, but you're usually dressed a little better. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned always travel with a tuxedo. I never know when I'm going to be asked to play. <laughs> So uh, one word you kept mentioning there that I know trips up a lot of newer members is past noble grand. Okay. So the one thing that um, 
I definitely, when I joined, had to kind of learn the nuances of, do you say past grand? Do you say past noble grand? Oh, no, you only say that for Rebecca's. And I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I've always wondered, why is there that distinction that the Rebecca's have a PNG, whereas Oddfellows is a PG? I don't know why. <laughs> and, and of all the answers to questions that I really, really, really dislike, it's because. <laughs> but but I, I have no other answer. The one use of the difference in terms is past noble grand means Rebecca. Past okay. grand means odd fellow. And there are distinctions in eligibility for various things that where a, a woman who is a Rebecca, but may also be an odd fellow may not be eligible for certain offices if she has not served as noble grand of an odd fellow lodge. Okay. So and that that's a very valid function. So even though we don't know the reason, that's a totally yeah, because because Skylar Colfax been. said so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I just didn't have that conversation with him. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that that actually that distinction does now that you put it that way hold a very uh, quick distinction for somebody to know, especially with so many members of of both being mm -hmm. active in both. That that immediately is a dead giveaway as to what they've served their position in. So. And some people have served as noble grand of both. Yes. And so they would be eligible for everything. <laughs> but, and for some past noble grands are eligible in the odd fellows for some things, not all. Yeah. And can I give you an example right now? Oh, please. Oh, do. I don't please. remember. I, I don't remember. Ah. <laughs> all right. I, just, I know that there is one. But I don't remember what it is. Maybe it'll hit you in five minutes and then he could like edit it back into the. I could only be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it'll just blurt it out. That's one of the nice things about pre recording these episodes the way we do is that I take everything and I edit it. So, um, you know, we have verbal pauses. I take those out, mistakes and, you know, misstatements. I take those out. I make us sound really cogent and intelligent by the time it goes out to the listeners. You all the times I walk all over lot. everybody. <laughs> I, I need all the help with um, intelligence and cogency. I'm not sure what that ought to be. So whatever you can do, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so now let's, let's look at this in a little bit different way. For the modern person who is joining the Odd Fellows, they have a choice. They can be an odd fellow or a Rebecca or both. So what do you see as some of the advantages of joining a Rebecca Lodge? That's a super question. Probably the biggest benefit that I see is broadening the knowledge within the order because each of the degrees has a lesson, a purpose, and the Rebecca degree has a lesson and a purpose that is supportive of, but different from the Oddfellow degrees. It's joining the Rebecca's is just another way to give service and, and perhaps be involved in different projects. In some locations that have both an Oddfellow Lodge and a Rebecca Lodge, they may have mostly joint projects, but not always. Some, the Oddfellows only do this, whatever this is. And this is a Rebecca project. And if, if this project is one that, that, 
a person happens to to really champion, join the Rebecca's to work on that project. You know, I would add something to that. I think that there is something that is culturally distinct about Rebecca Lodges, uh, owing to the tradition and history of being a female led organization for the majority of their history. And I think that Rebecca Lodges are places that can not just be fraternal and supportive, they're places that can be really nurturing. Uh, I have met some of the most wonderful people, uh, both in the Rebecca Lodges I have been a part of and in other Rebecca Lodges, because the degree, the Rebecca degree sets the tone for how the Lodge does things. And I think those themes of fidelity and support, um, mutual aid, um, that kind of nurturing aspect of it, I think that gives a different perspective on fraternalism. And that's the reason that I myself like being a Rebecca. It's a different experience because the Odd Fellows Lodge is primarily a place of doing business. You know, we have the degrees, mm -hmm. we teach the lessons. But at the same time, we also do a lot of the deeper looking into what we do as an organization in our encampment branch. So the Odd Fellows Lodge, because traditionally it was the place where business was done, and it was mostly about business. Well, then the complement to that is the Rebecca Lodge, where you get that sense of caring, you get that sense of nurturing, you get that sense of growth. And one of the ways in which I have seen some of the most successful things in Rebecca Lodges are when I get to go and visit a Rebecca Lodge and I get to see a really passionate group of professional women who come together and support each other. Uh, you know, I've seen it both uh, amongst working professionals who are still in their field and I've seen it amongst the retired professionals who are there. My home, Rebecca Lodge, which is Eola 63 in Buckley. Uh, we have a wonderful group of retired professional women there who are very happy to share their knowledge and experience mm -hmm. with younger people who come to Lodge and they say, oh, you know, I just had the worst day today at work. Oh, well, tell me about it. What happened? You know, it's great to have that built-in regular opportunity to be able to talk to people who are really not knowledgeable and have a lot of experience with things. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I, I think some of the differences that, that I've seen too are in the kinds of projects that the different lodges do. One Rebecca Lodge that I know, for example, builds backpacks that are age appropriate, gender appropriate, when young people, children are taken out of their homes and put into the foster care system. Many times the child in that situation leaves the home with what he or she is wearing and has no more. The, these backpacks have pajamas, an outfit, a toothbrush, plus the backpack itself, and, and there are more things in it as well. But that way the child has something after having been totally uprooted from everything he or she knows, here is something that's mine. And I, I know that this the one particular Rebecca Lodge, in fact, has had members join because they wanted to participate in that project. I've not heard Odd Fellows doing something like that. I'm not saying they haven't. I just haven't heard about it. My lodge, now in, in my case, it's my Odd Fellow Lodge and my Rebecca Lodge together. We buy water for our school. We, our lodge is in a very small town. They have a very small school with a lot of very, uh, very low socioeconomic students. When COVID hit and they had to shut off the water fountains, the kids oh. could be sure that they had water 
to bring to school. And so we had provided school supplies in the past. And in talking with the school administration, they said, you know, we don't need school supplies now. We need water. And so my lodges bought water. And with that, I can tell you that my Dodge Durango will hold 1,200 bottles of water. (laughs) Now, I could push it if and put maybe another 80 bottles in the front seat. Yeah. But, but in the back, 1,200 bottles, not a problem. <laughs> the front tires are lifted off the ground at that point. <laughs> and thank heavens, the guys at Costco loaded that for me. Oh, oh yes. yes. <laughs> That's the best part, when somebody else loads it and unloads it. Bring the forklift. Yeah. Yes. I, I helped with the unloading. But, uh, but yes, they loaded it for me. But we provided water for the school. Now, I don't think about schools needing water. No. But they did. And, and they, they knew with our support that they could turn to us and say, we need this, can you help? And yes, we did. And we have continued to throughout this school year. So those are the kinds of things the the human support things frequently come from Rebecca Lodges. Another Rebecca Lodge had a Christmas tree that they decorated with socks, all sizes, all colors, you name it. And then when they took the tree down, they gave the socks to the homeless shelter. Nice. And that's not a unique project at all, but, but there it was another Um, assembly president had as her project this is a Canadian project and I had to ask what it was toques yes I I didn't know what a toque was but she wanted toques for the homeless shelter it's a stocking cap Mm -hmm. okay and stocking caps I understood I just didn't know about toques and so (laughs) Everybody who came, or many who came to assembly, made toques and brought them to give to, I don't know that it was one shelter, but but to those in need. And there were, I don't know, bunches and bunches and boxes of them that came along. That was a Rebecca project. That is really impressive. And I have to say, I have never known an Odd Fellows Lodge to ever take on a project that involved crocheting or knitting. <laughs> Not that they couldn't. That either. <laughs> In fact, uh, if there were any Odd Fellows Lodge that ever did take on a project like that, please email us at <laughs> three links oddcast at gmail.com. That's the number three. The number three links oddcast at gmail.com. Because we are very interested to hear about the interesting things that are happening in Odd Fellowship. So if there is an Odd Fellows Lodge where they've all got their crochet hooks and knitting needles and they're making hats, we definitely want to hear about that. Because that would be a very unique project and much better than the annual $50 donation to the Arthritis Foundation. Not that we don't love the donation to the Arthritis Foundation, but it's not nearly... Uh, as interesting as a Lodge of Odd Fellows crocheting and knitting together. That's one I would want to see. <laughs> well, this is a good opportunity for us to take a break and listen to a wonderful message here from Pig and a Pug Bath Stuff. So we're going to do that and then come back with some more about the Rebecca's with Sister Elizabeth Mowry Harb Street. All right. Be honest, how much do you spend on coffee every month? $20? $50? $1,500? Well, that's probably not realistic. Anyway, I digress. Where was I? Oh yeah, pig and a pug. For the price of one of your not-as-good-as-last-time lattes, one of your, what is this, 90% milk macchiatos, or about 350 cups of Folgers, you can get yourself some handmade soap. Yeah, handmade. And 
with the best ingredients and the most attention to detail that you could conceivably ask for. This stuff smells so good, it will align your chakras, send out multiple namastes, and best yet, make you smell like you don't spend the majority of your time these days walking around in your pajamas. Being that we're all home a lot more these days, we might even just take more showers just because we're bored. And it's fine for that too. Smell good whenever you want. Each order is packed with the greatest of care and includes freebies and loads of positivity. Listen, don't start an argument by telling the people that you love or people that you live with that they stink. Just get them a bar of soap and uh, Robert is your father's brother. So, take a minute, pop over to Etsy or Facebook and look up Pig and a Pug. Just bang in the coupon code THANK YOU 24 and you're going to get 24% off your order. Literally, that's all you have to do. Pig and a Pug, Pig and a Pug, Pig and a Pug. All right, welcome back to the Three Links Oddcast. Uh, Toby and Ainsley here. We're joined by IARA president, Sister Elizabeth Mowry Harbstrite. So hearing that you joined the Rebecca's upon turning 18 in what year was that again? 1971? Something or other. 79. 79. No, 69. Okay. 69. You're making me younger. Oh, okay. We're 1969. Trying. Wow. Okay. Uh-huh. So you have been a Rebecca for 51. Years. 51 years. So you've been a Rebecca longer than I've been alive. I always love asking longtime members this question. And so I'm going to ask this for you. Why are you a Rebecca? And what I mean by that is for as long as you've been a Rebecca, I'm sure there's been many ups and downs and challenges that make you just want to throw up your hands and quit and say, I don't know why I'm doing this. We all as members have our challenges because being a member of an organization like this, like we're actually paying to do all this stuff. We're not paying. It's not even like this is our jobs. We're paying money and time and energy and blood and sweat and tears to not only help our communities, but hopefully help ourselves be better people. And with all the frustrations and glory and everything that comes along with that. So for you, with all that I've just said, longevity wise, why are like, what keeps you going? Well, how are you a Rebecca after all these years? When I was initiated, let me go back before that. As a child, if daddy went to lodge, I knew it was Tuesday because daddy always went to lodge on Tuesday. If mom went to lodge, then that means today is Thursday because mom always went to lodge on Thursday. Back then the lodges met weekly. And so when I turned 18, it was just, uh, it was a given that I was going to join Rebecca's. And the night that I was initiated, my mom, dad, grandma, and great grandma were all there with me. It, it was a family thing. And as I said, my lodge was named for my great grandfather. So it, it was because of the, the connections. And I, I was in, a, I lived outside a little town of 212. And I think the 212 might have included the goldfish. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, but the lodge was integral in the community. And so I knew everybody, everybody knew me. It was, it was just another linkage with my community. And then as life happened and I moved, I moved my membership and continued as a Rebecca. Being a Rebecca gave me the opportunity to have, to have a niche in, in the community. It was a way to meet people that I might not otherwise have met. In fact, probably would not otherwise have met because I was active in my profession. And, and so that, that took me a different direction. And as, as I continued, it, it gave me those connections with people that I, 
I valued in addition to believing in the tenets of the order. It gave me a chance to, to develop leadership skill. And because of that, I, I'm confident that I advanced more in my profession because of the skill that I had developed as a Rebecca. When, when I was elected warden, which is effectively the second vice president in the assembly, I was so scared about speaking that my kneecaps quivered. I was glad to be wearing a long dress because then nobody could see. But, but I was scared to speak. And two years after that, Sovereign Grand Lodge and International Association of Rebecca Assemblies met in Missouri. And because I was then president, I, um, I was the official hostess, if you will, for the session mm -hmm. and had to give the, the opening welcome at the opening session. There were 3,000 people at that opening session. Oh, wow. And we were in a, a grand old hotel ballroom where we walked in with the spotlights and all that, sharing the podium with the lieutenant governor. You know, it was, it was a big deal. It came time for me to speak. I went to the podium, I did my thing, went back and sat down, realized that I had done it without being nervous. And then my stomach started flipping. <laughs> <laughs> but, but all of that practice in speaking was because of Rebecca's. And I, I don't, I have no, no faith that I would have advanced in my profession as I did without the skills that I developed in Rebecca's. That's beautiful that you make that connection with the public speaking and being a member and how it fosters that because that's exactly what happened with Skylar Colfax. Yes, because From our presidential Odd Fellows episode. Yes, he was known as one of the great orders of his time. And he credited that to being an odd fellow. And as we all know, listening that he was the writer of the beautiful Rebecca degree. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a great connection. And that I, that self-improvement professionally is something that I think often does get overlooked as an advantage of being a member of an organization like ours is that you learn these skills, even though they're not necessarily fun skills, they're useful skills that and help us in our necessary, lives necessary necessary yes. skills yeah and it's kind of like in school like the least fun class i ever took was the keyboarding like typing class but that's probably one of the most useful classes i've ever taken in my whole life and when i talk about my professional life i was a teacher i taught keyboarding oh really mm -hmm. business education but okay. but i did teach keyboarding mm -hmm. one year or two Otherwise, I was teaching the advanced business classes and morphed into computer classes. And so as a teacher, you would think that speaking was a comfortable thing to do. No, 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 no. Rebecca's made it a comfortable thing to do as a teacher. That's awesome. Well, I've got a follow up question for you. You've told us about your 50 plus years as a Rebecca. So two things to follow up on that. First of all, how has the experience of a Rebecca changed in that time? And how has your experience as a Rebecca changed in that time? When, well, first of all, over, over a 50 plus year span, society has changed. In fact, it didn't even take 50 years, but trust me. And Ainsley, I know you don't go back that far, but trust <laughs> me, it's changed. <laughs> and just the changes I've noticed now that I've hit 40, like just, I'm like, wow, I think I'm starting to get it now. Yeah. Uh -huh. You, you yeah. have that experience that happens once you hit middle age, when you see the things that you remember being popular 20 years ago, now kids are doing it and you're like, why are you doing that? It really wasn't that good in the 80s. Yes. Well, when I joined Rebecca's, I, 
number one, lived, as I said, outside this town of 212. Rural, relatively low income, farming community. And it was a big deal to have a lodge visit at one of the other lodges in our district. Going 20 miles away for lodge to, to visit there was quite a thing. Hmm. Or to go, oh, another lodge was about 35 miles away. We didn't do that without planning and, and anticipation. Well, now we drive 20 miles to get across town, to get across Kansas City and don't think anything about it. Or we hop in the car for a weekend and we'll go 300 miles away just for fun. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen then. Through And here's another thing about Rebecca's. When I went beyond the district and started attending assembly and found all of these other people who shared the same beliefs that I did. And you know what? I liked them. They were nice people. I yes. made friends. <laughs> and that was at the, the state level. And then as travel expanded and meeting people from throughout the country and then Canada. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and we're all alike. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think maybe I deviated from your question, Toby. I'm not sure where I was supposed to go. That no, that is actually a very good answer. And, and it brings up one of my favorite things about uh, when I first started attending Grand Lodge and Rebecca Assembly. There was a Rebecca who's very, very sweet lady named June Robinson, and she belonged to the Salmon Bay Rebecca Lodge in Seattle. And June was known at assembly as the hug lady. Oh. And you you had not truly attended grand sessions until you met June and got your hug. Now, of course. I was a member of her Rebecca Lodge in Seattle, so I knew her already, but I still got to go through the line and get my hug from Sister June uh, at assembly. And it's those kinds of things, uh, like you talked about how it was a big deal to go 20 miles away for a lodge visitation. It's like, hey, we're all going to go visit the lodge in the next county over. Mm -hmm. That that is such a, a precious part of American history uh, because prior to World War II, of course, almost everything that happened in civic life was largely connected to fraternalism in some way. You know, especially you were in a rural area, so probably lots of granges out there. Um, the area that I live in uh, used to be rural and we had plenty of granges here, in fact, uh, the Grange here in my hometown, Graham, Washington, uh, had a lot of overlap in membership with the Kapows and Rebecca Lodge because that was the thing that rural farm families did. They mm -hmm. joined something because that's how you got your sense of community. So that idea of we're having a picnic at the lodge or we're all going over to Fairview uh, for their meeting on Thursday night and everybody dressing up. And that was an event that was so right. important in that fabric of especially small town and rural life. Now, of course, I can't say what it was like growing up in the city because I did not. You know, <laughs> I grew up out here with all the dairy farms and uh, whatnot in South Pierce County. So the second part of my question was how your experience as a Rebecca has changed through the years. So what can you tell us about that? Early on, it was an honor to be asked to accept an office, to accept responsibility in the leadership path and it was quite, um, it, it, it was an honor and not everyone was asked at the same time. It was, as we've talked earlier about some of the mentoring, it 
it was when a mentor saw that a new member was was ready to advance. It that has changed. In too many instances, I'm seeing now where people don't want to take the responsibility to lead. And sometimes the one who says, okay, I'll do it, is not the leader. Not from not wanting to lead, but not knowing how or not having had the preparation through a series of experiences to be able to lead an organization successfully. When things are, are going well, anybody can be at the head because there's, there are no obstacles. When we have obstacles, it takes a leader to help the organization to navigate those obstacles. And I'm, I'm seeing that we haven't done a good job in in growing our leaders to navigate those obstacles. And I, I think that's a negative that has, has happened in those 50 years. Um, something that, that we need to, to address now to turn, turn that around. We need to go back in that instance to the mentoring that happened years ago for, for the successful extension of our future. I think that is a very wise and prescient observation on your part, because I can remember the, the sense of thrill that would come about when someone who had attended the Rebecca Assembly for many years was asked to get everything in order to mm -hmm. make a run for Assembly Warden, because the group of past presidents would say, I think she's ready. Ask her to get her resume together, get her things in order because she's going to be nominated for assembly warden. And that was such a thrilling moment. It was thrilling yeah. for the assembly. It was amazing for the members. And as the numbers have declined overall, that's something that has really been lost. That sense of, showing up on Sunday night, everybody going to the memorial service, and then the chatter in the hallways at the hotel. Oh, who's going to get nominated this year? And in too many places, it's gone from that anticipation of who might be asked to run to, well, who hasn't been the president for the longest? We'll run that person through as a warden. You know, and it's, it's sad to see the way that uh, we've had to adapt to the lower numbers uh, as that has come along uh, because that was always such a thrilling moment. But, right. you know, my, my experience goes back to, um, <clears throat> I think we're now far along in history enough that I can say this, the turn of the century. <laughs> I was initiated in 2000. So I remember there were still... 90 Rebecca Lodges in Washington, and it was a big topic of speculation who was going to be asked to run for assembly warden. You know, this mm -hmm. member had done all of this and had built a very impressive resume of accomplishments uh, in her Rebecca Lodge and in her district association. And these are the projects she had worked on, and these are some of the plans she has for the future. And the way in which there was a, a grooming and a learning process in that. And that also used to happen in our Grand Lodge. Um, one of our dearly departed past Grand Masters here in Washington, Donald Hepp, um, he used to be in charge of a lot of stuff in the state. He used to do degree days at the Olympia Lodge. He used to organize a lot of the installations that happened in Southwest Washington. And he told me one time um, sometime in the mid seventies, he was at sessions and he got nominated for grand junior warden of the grand encampment. And, uh, he was elected to that position and the past grand masters at the time were upset with him because they said, Don, 
didn't you get it? We wanted to run you as Grand Warden of the Grand Lodge, and here you are going through the Grand Encampment chairs, and we thought you were ready for Grand Lodge. And Don had to say, well, I'm I'm sorry, brothers. I, I didn't realize that. I, uh, I took the route through the encampment. Now, eventually, he did get elected Grand Master and did a wonderful job here in Washington, but that's the way it used to be. You would sit there on on the side at Grand Lodge or Assembly and you'd learn how things happened and you would learn who was running the committees and where ideas were exchanged and you'd work your way th up through the system. And we don't have enough people. We don't have enough lodges now. And so that old way of doing it has sort of gone away. And now it's like, okay, we've got 12 people attending Assembly this year. Who wants to run for assembly warden this year you okay you you were last president in 2008 you can go through again and that whole sense of working your way up at the state or provincial level has just almost been lost now in larger jurisdictions you can probably still do that to some extent but um and it's yeah. it still happens some here in washington not as much as uh, oregon for example i have to commend the jurisdiction of oregon because they work very hard to help and support lodges that need assistance so they can keep going. And that's why Oregon has managed to save so many of their lodges. Well, they have enough lodges that they have saved that they really have that old fashioned kind of working your way up through the ranks that occurs in Oregon, which is wonderful to see. It's one of the things I like about visiting their sessions. I attended an assembly, oh, many years ago in a jurisdiction where I had visited multiple times. And the president that year used the ladybug as her symbol. And she asked for all of the first time attendees or all of the out of jurisdiction guests to stand. And so as an out of jurisdiction guest, I did. She assigned each one of those guests or, or new attendees a bug buddy. And we had pins. One, I think, I don't remember the difference, but there was one for the mentor and one for the mentee. But it was so, so thoughtful. Yeah. That there was the, the start of that, like you were saying, working mm -hmm. up and working through so that if someone had a question about, well, why is that person doing whatever? Well, that committee does this, this is how it works and, and so on. It, it was that orientation that was happening on the fly rather than sitting through some drudgery of here's what's going to happen, here's what you're going to see, <laughs> snore, snore. It um, was much more effective than that. I think that's a fantastic yeah. idea. That's wonderful. That obviously is something that needs to be done across the board, the mentoring. And without it, we are experiencing a, lot, uh, a large lapse in leadership capability or people that are willing to do it. Like you said, they just don't have the skill set necessary they, or the, you know, they might be passionate, excuse me, uh, passionate enough, but not savvy enough. Um, so going forward, we all have a lot of uh, work to do, clearly. Um, so there's been a lot of talk over the last, you know, handful of years of this 10 year plan or this five year plan that supposedly is going to wrap all the, the, um, the Rebecca's and the encampment, everything all into the odd fellows lodge. And, um, I always hear every year at session, you know, the kind of the gossip and the rumors behind it. And I, you know, I could hear through the wall at session. I could hear the Rebecca's on the other side, angry saying, you know, like, you know, they're not going to get rid of Rebecca's while I'm around and I'll never join the odd fellows. I'm not an odd fellow. I'm a Rebecca. My mom was Rebecca. My grandma was Rebecca. My great grandmother was Rebecca. My aunt was a Rebecca. And that important same family, that family lineage that is mm -hmm. so important. Um, where do you think in your, I guess, you know, I, either in like your idealized vision or, or 
even the reality, um, where do you think the Rebecca's should go or need to go or are going um, in the next go five years, 10 years, um, regardless of whatever sovereign can do? Because I feel like I feel like the way that's been going, that just keep that can keeps getting kicked down the road. So regardless of sovereign interfering in any legislative mm-hmm. way, if things kind of just keep on carrying on the way they are, um, what do you think the future is for the Rebecca's as a, as an organization? I think it's murky. I, I think my crystal ball, number one, is cloudy. Mm-hmm. But, but number two, I believe it's very hard to, to have a vision when we, as a generic statement, don't quite know who we are and don't quite know where we want to go, much less where we can agree on going. Um, in Europe, the, their organizational model is that the juris, a jurisdiction has a grand sire and then they, for their officers under grand sire, they have a male officer and a female officer. Hmm. And it, that model works very effectively for them. They have a brother secretary, they have a sister secretary. And I can see that kind of, of structure working, but only if we as an organization chart that as our chosen course. I do not believe it is going to be successful for Sovereign Grand Lodge to say, this is the way it is and pound the table. (laughs) Or for Rebecca's to say, not in my lifetime, it's not. (laughs) I don't think either end of that spectrum is going to work. And until we can respect each other and work for the common good of our order, I see a murky future. That doesn't mean we won't be successful, Mm -hmm. but I believe it does mean that we will not be as successful as we could be if we were of common vision. I think that's an excellent answer because I, I think it really, it really gets to the heart of one of the things that goes unspoken in odd fellowship, which is if we have men and women who can join either branch, um, do we have any kind of clear direction for what you get out of those? Or is it just kind of left up to individual units to determine that? Because for a long time, we had this dichotomy. It's like, okay, men are odd fellows. Oh, yeah, and they can also join the Rebecca Lodge. That way they can do something on Tuesday night with their wives. But we didn't have that same kind of interchange with women joining the, the odd fellows until just after I joined in 2001 when it was opened up to women to be odd fellows. And all of a sudden, you you sort of removed the artificial divide between the two organizations and you started to allow some of that culture to flow between the two. You know, I think that probably the best example of it that I'm familiar with is the concept of Rebecca food, which are all of those charming semi-edible casseroles that get presented for every lodge installation. Oh yes, jello with shredded carrots and raisins. Yum. Please may I have more. And deviled ham sandwiches. Oh boy. <laughs> but by removing that, it allowed this sort of cultural exchange and it hasn't been well defined. You know, I think there are great things that are endemic to the Rebecca degree, to Rebecca Lodges, and to the whole Rebecca experience. And I never want to lose those things. But at the same time, some of that is now allowed to flow into Odd Fellowship in certain ways. And so I think when you say that we have a murky future because we can't agree on who we are and where we're going, I think that is a very, very astute observation because where exactly are we going? What 
is the mission going forward for our odd fellow and Rebecca Lodges? Because as you mentioned earlier, not every lodge has a companion in the same building. Not every odd fellows lodge still has its Rebecca Lodge and vice versa. You know, we do have Rebecca Lodges that are the sole remaining lodge in what used to be an Odd Fellows Temple, where they had an Odd Fellow Lodge, Rebecca Lodge, Encampment, LEA. Uh, maybe they even had their local Canton and LAPM there. So, w what do we do when it gets down to being just the Rebecca Lodge in that building and they are the lone beacon of Odd Fellowship in that area? That is a very, very good question for our organization going forward. I absolutely agree with you. And unfortunately, I'm not sure how that conversation progresses. I don't believe it happens on the Sovereign Grand Lodge floor, on the international floor. I think it has to start with a core of well-respected people having a conversation that at times may be uncomfortable. The problem then is how to, to take the core and add those concentric circles of visioning, not vision, but visioning to, to move us forward. And until, until we have those concentric circles, I think the the murky view will remain in place. Yeah, that's very, very, very good insight there. So I have one last question for you. <clears throat> and I'm going to make this uh, a little bit personal, uh, just because uh, I think that will make it very personal to our listeners. And that is, uh, my daughter is 24 years old. She's going to college. She's uh, eventually going to be a teacher. Good. Let's say through happenstance, you happen to sit down next to her in a public place and strike up a conversation with her. What would you tell her about the Rebecca's and why you think she might want to join? Now, spoiler alert. She also belongs to my Rebecca lot. She actually <laughs> grew up in the Theta Row Club here, so she was already on that track from age mm -hmm. eight. But, you know, you don't know that about her. So what's the conversation that you would have with uh, a young woman in her mid-20s now um, who might be receptive and open to doing something very much community-based like a lodge or other organization like that? I would ask her what her passions are. What does she like to do? What, what captures her attention separate from her profession? What, what is her spark? And then how could she bring her spark to the community to help others improve and, and share the spark. And then how would she like to join with others to expand that others who share that spark and have ideas and want her ideas to, to expand what they can do, multiplying the effort so that none of us has to do this alone but together, look at the possibilities. Would you like to join us, join us with that? Ooh, that's good. That is good. That is very good. And it's very inspirational. One thing that I think not everybody in leadership in Odd Fellowship understands that younger people are actually looking for meaningful human interaction. They actually mm -hmm. want to do things with other people in real life. It's too easy for senior leadership to look at the young people they know and go, ah, oh, all they want to do is sit there on their phones all day. We've actually been saying that about young members who are in the order since at least the 1950s when television is what was killing lodges. And yet we still have lodges. 
one of the things that gets missed is that young people really, really, really want to be a part of something where they can be passionate, where they can do something they feel is meaningful, and where they feel like they are intrinsically appreciated. And that's one thing that I think we have so much of to share in Odd Fellowship. But when we have to not only invite them in, but we have to say, we will support you, we will encourage you, we will walk beside you, not, well, I have chaired this committee for <laughs> many years. <laughs> this is the way it works. Now, I hear you have another idea, but I'm telling you, we tried that 17 years ago <laughs> and it failed. This is the way it works. And now <laughs> I know you have been president of your Rebecca assembly. <laughs> <laughs> Three times. <laughs> uh, see, that's that is that is the kind of experience that a unit head has, where you go in and you talk to lodges. The lodge says, "Yeah, we don't have any new members." Well, what happened the last time you had somebody come in and join? Oh, we had this guy try and join us five or six years ago. He sh he showed up. He had a bunch of ideas and stuff. He didn't understand how we do things here. Yeah, did he ever come back? Says, oh, I don't know. No. He's not here now. It's like, oh, well, you know, did you talk to him? Did you explain how things are? Did you give him a chance to do anything? Well, no. Okay, so why do you think he's going to stick around? I visited uh, the Rebecca Lodge and one of the Odd Fellows Lodges in Honolulu last year. Nice. And I was so impressed with, with so many things that they do. They have a different project every month. And my question was, well, does everybody do every project? Oh, no. No. Some have most people, but different ones do what they want to do. The project that they were doing the Saturday after I was there was doing maintenance on the USS Missouri. Hmm. Wow. They were going to polish the brass and and give it the the spit and polish process. And I was so sorry that I was leaving before that. I would have loved to That'd have be been a part of that, particularly with the connection to Missouri. That's right. Um, and plus to stay a little bit longer in Hawaii. <laughs> well, yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> But I, I was so impressed that they don't have projects once in a while, every single month. And they allow it to be a smaller scale thing that if only four or five people want to do it, that's fine. Just do it. Mm -hmm. that's, exactly. that's, that's a smart approach. But with the USS Missouri, for example, I've forgotten they had 30, 35, 40 volunteers who were going to be working on that because that's what they needed for yeah. that particular project. And they do that, they do the Missouri quarterly. Oh, wow. If they did at that point with COVID. Uh, I think the Missouri has been shut down for a while, but, but I, I was impressed with, with what I learned in, in that visit. That's cool. And I feel like if lodges, are, if we're treating Odd Fellowship or being a Rebecca like it's a, a product we're selling, and one thing we need to, aside with the mentoring like you mentioned before, is we need to make sure lodges are what we're telling people, what we're selling people who join is actually what they're getting when they go to their right. lodge, that it isn't just a kitchen table lodge where they sit around and bicker about anything new or different or trying anything that they're actually getting out there and doing stuff. And I think that's a very, um, that's yeah, that exactly like that approach that they're doing in, uh, in, in Honolulu definitely seems like a great approach to just stay active, keep getting yourselves out there in the community, keep doing projects. They don't have to be big. They don't have to be massive. Just do something. And that, that is such excellent advice. I feel like, 
now I really need to go spend several months visiting the lodge in Honolulu so I can learn from them. <laughs> I, I'm sure. I'm sure, brother uh, Taka would be very, very excited to uh, like let you let you stay with him for a bit. Yeah, you know, at least three or four months, just so I can really ingrain myself <laughs> in the the local lodge culture. You know, they, they were very hospitable, and in fact, one of the brothers even sent me uh, the USS Missouri pins that nice. they have. I was so touched. But he said he wanted he wanted me to have that. It was it uh, it was heartwarming to me. And nice. you know that is one of the parts of Odd Fellowship I love the most is we love visiting members from other places. One of my absolute favorite experiences as Grandmaster was visiting Excelsior Lodge Number One Eleven in the town of Bickleton, Washington. It is a little farm town of probably eh, two to three hundred people, maybe um, southeast mm -hmm. of Yakima. Um, really isolated. It's not even on a state highway. You've got to take the road that winds up Alder Creek, um, you know, out through the wheat fields to get there. And when I showed up for that visitation, they basically shut down the town because the town <laughs> only has one commercial entity. It has a sort of general grocery store slash delicatessen where you can get hot food for part of the day. They shut down the store at six o'clock and they put tables in the middle of the store and had a banquet there in my honor in mm -hmm. this little town in East. Oh, wow. Washington. Because it's so special. Now, first of all, because they are remote, uh, it had been a couple years since a Grandmaster had been able to visit them. But they, it was such a special event for them. And to be able to celebrate that with them was just such an amazing thing. You know, it doesn't matter if you are an initiatory degree member uh, who's only been a member for six months and you come visiting from the other side of the state. We love that. We love it when other members show up and visit. We just love that so much. And it's one of the things that I really love uh, traveling. You know, I do a lot of traveling here around the Northwest professionally. All I have to do to find instant friends is to stop off at the lodge on a meeting night. And they just love it. And they get to practice uh, the process of proving me as a member. You know, they all have to look it up. It's, what questions are you right. supposed to ask? It's, you know, do I know the signs of this and the password for that? And it's fun for them. It's just a great experience to be a member and traveling and always know you've got these great people in this other location. That's the fun thing about, I, I think that a lot of people might discount from, they might think it's like a little cheesy, but the reality of it is actually it's really refreshing to be a part of a organization of people that are so happy to see you, even if it's the first time they've met you and to like anywhere you go, it doesn't matter who you are. They treat every single person like they're a celebrity just because they're just genuinely glad that you're there and you could just be like the new guy but they're so glad you're there and you could be whoever. And it's, it's just a wonderful thing. And just people that are just happy that you exist. Like it, it sounds kind of Mr. Rogersy, but it's really refreshing kind of to have that in a world where everybody's at each other's throats all the time and kind of ready to cut somebody down. That, and when we go to another lodge, it serves two purposes. Number one, yes, we do share the same values, but number two, we demonstrate that in different ways. Mm -hmm. When I started traveling, my eyes were open so wide because I thought everybody did it the way my lodge did it. Oh, what a joke that was. <laughs> I, I learned that we may have the same ritual, but it doesn't always show. But the projects 
that mm -hmm. the lodge 20 miles away did were different from what we did, but what a good idea. And we could adapt that to make it fit what we do. We didn't have to recreate the wheel. We yeah. could take someone else's idea and make it work where we are. And everybody was better for it. And they're glad to share the idea and not Absolutely. feel like you're stealing their idea. No, no, let's expand it. Let's make yeah, it. Yeah, the better. sharing. Yeah, the sharing of ideas and the generosity of the um, back and forth, definitely. Well, you have been uh, an incredibly eloquent and passionate spokesperson uh, for Odd Fellowship and for the Rebecca's uh, specifically. I really want to thank you for taking some time to sit down and uh, join us, sister. It's been wonderful having you here on the podcast. Is there anything else uh, that you would like to share with us before we wrap it up? Like maybe some funny stories from your travels or wise words, uh, you know, the stuff you normally get asked to say at the end of your speech at every Rebecca assembly you visit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I normally end my speeches with a poem. I, I won't give you the poem in its entirety, but to tell you that, um, well, maybe I will. Go ahead. I shot, I shot an arrow into the air it fell to earth, I know not where, for so swiftly it flew, the sight could not follow it in its flight. I breathed a song into the air. It fell to earth, I know not where, for who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of song? Long, long afterward in an oak, I found the arrow still unbroke. And the song from beginning to end, I found again, in the heart of a friend. That reminds me that our words and our actions can be arrows or songs. And may we always be wise enough as Odd Fellows and Rebecca's to have the songs that we share with those around us. And if anybody needs to hear some songs, they should check out our previous episode. That's right. Absolutely true. <laughs> yes. Or Wednesday nights with Toby, either of those. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yeah. I have to say, I am genuinely impressed by the number of downloads that we've gotten for that Music of Odd Fellowship episode. Good. It was a very long episode, over two hours. And, you know, normally we try and keep them to about um, 75 to 90 minutes so they're not too long. But that has become one of our most downloaded episodes. And you were going to split that up into two. Yeah, I was thinking of splitting that into two episodes. But I'm, I'm glad I kept it all together as one episode because it has really driven a lot of interest uh, in the podcast. Which is fantastic <laughs> because what we're really trying to do here... Um, is, you know, I'm not just doing this because I want more practice at editing speech. Uh, we're doing this because we believe that Odd Fellowship has a unique and wonderful message, and this is a way that we can share it. So, you know, I'm always very excited when I see the download numbers going up for a particular episode. It's wonderful. And before we go, we always have a segment called The Odd Podge, uh, in which people get to share what Ever they feel like. Now, I should mention, we do not have a Lodge shout-out for this episode because no one sent us one. So come on, listeners, if your Lodge is doing something interesting or cool or something that you want to share, tell us about it, and we will make them the shout-out on one of our episodes. But we did not get one this week, so uh, there is no shout-out. So we're going to go to the Odd Podge. Uh, so, Brother Ainsley... Is there anything in yep. particular you would like to share? Yes, I have a Rebecca related one that oh, I wonderful. so so yep. So here's my here's my Rebecca dues card just to show you. Yes, I'm I'm a bro Becca. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard I don't know if you've heard that term being thrown around for the oh, I have it. What fun. <laughs> yeah, so I guess the um the Waxahachie guys, I think it might have been where they they might have been the ones to coin it. Um, so the, the brothers that are joining the Rebecca's are they're calling them the bro Becca's, and I I think that's fantastic. So, um, so I'm a member of Owl Creek 91 and, um, that is also, um, 
Danelda Davis's home lodge. Okay. And I've never met her, but uh, apparently she is quite well known among the Rebecca community. Yes. And so when I joined a couple years ago, um, I was given my uh, Rebecca regalia, the, you know, the beehive with the, the cord. Right. And that was Danelda's personal regalia that she had given to the lodge with the instructions to give it to the next person who joined the Rebecca Lodge there. And I guess that jewel had been sitting around for quite a long time. And then I, I joined and I, I've got Danelda's uh, donated jewel. So that's my Dan regalia. Danelda is, is a contributor. She's okay. active. She, she wants, she wants to, to do. Mm -hmm. And I see that with you doing as you are, you are carrying her active commitment very well. So I would say that regalia is well placed, Ainsley. Well, thank you. That is excellent. I, I always love it when, you know, we have so many uh, articles, items, emblems of our past that just go by the wayside or they end up on eBay. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Yes. I love it when they they come back to a member. You know, that is something that is incredibly beautiful. So a good I, thing. I tell everybody they, who who emails through the website, they're like, hey, I've got this thing that was my mom's or my grandpa's or I want to donate it back. I'm like, yes, please, please donate it back because we've actually put this stuff back into service. It's part of mm -hmm. our, our living history of the organization. And yes, it won't just be sitting in a drawer somewhere for another 50 years, like that jewel will be put to use as Toby can testify. Yes. Now for my odd podge, uh, I'm going to give an update on something that I talked about uh, probably uh, late summer last year. Uh, and that's the, the effort that I'm involved in here in Washington to revive Enterprise Lodge number two. Uh, that was the Odd Fellows Lodge in Walla Walla. They were chartered in 1863 oh during the Civil War, and they were the second lodge chartered in Washington. Uh, Olympia number one is still going. They were 1855. Enterprise number two in Walla Walla was 1863. Well, in 2014, that lodge unfortunately gave up its charter. And uh, through some contacts on Instagram and some friends that I have in the area, uh, Two, about two years ago, uh, I found someone who was very interested in joining the Odd Fellows in Walla Walla. And I had to say, well, you're about four years too late for that because they had given up their charter. And so I talked to her a little more and I said, well, if you can get some friends and family members together, go join the lodge in Richland, get your degrees, take some withdrawal cards, and then apply to the Grand Lodge you can get the charter back for enterprise number two. And so um, she worked on it a little bit. Uh, some things happened, you know, life sometimes gets in the way of fraternalism. A little, little pandemic here and there, you know? Yeah. A little <laughs> bit of the Rona going around <laughs> folks being locked in their homes. So middle of last week, I get a text message from her uh, with pictures. She has, Four applications for the lodge in Richland. Uh, they met with the Noble Grand from the lodge, and uh, they're making progress. As soon as that county is open for meetings again, they're going to interview those four applicants and then make arrangements to get them initiated. So, Lord willing and the creek don't rise, we might just be able to resurrect Enterprise Lodge number two. Wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's, I. it hasn't happened yet, but we're getting really close. You know, we've got four people and fortunately we, we still have a few former members of the lodge who live in the area uh, and some other people uh, who are willing to take associate memberships in the new lodge uh, so that there will be a certain amount of experienced membership available to help guide the lodge. So 
Right. I'm hoping that uh, maybe by fall of this year, uh, everybody will be able to meet again here in Washington State, and we might just have one more lodge. Very good. And now for you, Sister Elizabeth, is there anything that you would like to share with us in the Odd Podge? I just feel like I've been sharing a whole lot already. Well, you have. You've been fantastic. You're an excellent guest. Um, just the, the potential for membership in this order is limited only by the member's willingness to participate. We've talked about the leadership, the public speaking, the contribution to the community through projects, the, the friendships that, that are built. I met my dearest friend, other than my husband, of course, through Rebecca's. And that friendship, she lived in California, I lived in Missouri, and, and we were the best friends closer than, than rel blood relatives because we were related by choice. And that was only because Rebecca's brought us together. The possibilities are endless. And I encourage all people who want to expand their, their thinking, their opportunities to join the Oddfellows and Rebecca's because everything is possible. Thank you so much. That is beautiful. And hey, if you don't have an application already, go to the website and you can download one. And where do they find that, Ainsley? IOOF.org. Yes, IOOF. It doesn't stand for 100 feet. No. <laughs> it is IOOF.org. You can download the application. You can get in touch with Sovereign Grand Lodge. You want to find out how to join and where, just click on that uh, contact us link and uh, we will put you in touch with our team of people who oversee membership requests and they will get you in touch with your local jurisdiction. Unless it's one of those square states in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> but we're not going to mention which one. No. <laughs> they know who they are. Well, the website is also <laughs> such a wonderful resource though for for publications for information about our projects for applications for our scholarships the the mm -hmm. website is really the place to go to learn so much about who we are and what we do and how we do it and good thing you mentioned those uh, applications for scholarships for anybody out there listening. I just updated the scholarships on IOOF.org that you could find under our projects under Educational Foundation. They're um, updated so you could actually fill out the scholarship as a PDF without having to print it out and fill it out by hand. So that is a brand new feature available. So you could fill it out on your uh, Adobe Acrobat and then upload that file back into the email to go to the Educational Foundation, much easier than before. And from the evaluator's side, much easier than before. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure Ken worked very hard to get those applications to be embeddable, typable, functional. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Tremendous step forward. All right. Well, for our next episode, we are going to invite the Goat Boys on board again. And we're going to do a crossover with the Modern Goat Rider podcast and uh, kind of do something like what we did last fall where we got together and uh, do a crossover episode. So they will have one half of the episode. We will have one half of it here on the Three Links Oddcast. So we're going to be talking about some of the contemporary issues that we're dealing with, uh, especially with the pandemic going on. And Lodge is not always able to meet, not always able to do kind of the projects they normally do and have the social events they normally would. So be sure and check out that next episode. It's going to be a special crossover with Modern Goat Rider. Now, before we go, I want to thank you again, Sister Elizabeth. And I want to share with you 
uh, an anecdote that you especially will appreciate. Now, I know that as a, an international unit head, you've had to do a lot of traveling and a lot of visitation. You know, this is your second year as IARA president. And before that, you were vice president and then warden. So you get introduced in a lot of places. And uh, although your name makes sense, Maori Harbstripe, it can be a bit of a mouthful for some people to pronounce. Yes. So I want to tell you a little story uh, about uh, an odd fellow that you may have known because he's from your part of the country. Uh, and that was uh, the wonderful C. LaVon Lawson of Oklahoma. Yes. So my first year going to Grand Lodge in Washington, uh, he was Sovereign Grand Warden and he came out to visit our session. But of course, a, a name like C. LaVon Lawson sounds like so many other things that when you're dealing with people who don't always necessarily hear things well, <laughs> uh -oh. he, he had his name butchered all week long at the grand encampment. They butchered his name in the Rebecca assembly. They butchered his name in the grand lodge. They butchered his name. So finally the last day of grand lodge, uh, I, I got up there and I said, you know, it's, Thank you. It's been wonderful. And I really want to thank uh, our visitor from the Sovereign Grand Lodge, D. Laverne Larson. <laughs> and the whole place just cracked up because they knew that the poor guy had gotten his name run through the, the wood chipper all week long. <laughs> it's like a bad game of telephone. <laughs> <laughs> and he he appreciated that so much he he gave me uh one of uh the pins that he had uh it was of a purple lyre uh which is the classical greek instrument uh we use it on the musicians regalia uh in the odd fellows and uh, i always remembered that because he was so appreciative uh, that someone could have fun with the constant butchery of his name <laughs> <laughs> oh yes <laughs> i i knew you would appreciate that especially because i've heard your name mispronounced a few times <laughs> oh and there have been more <laughs> <laughs> I bet. And, and that's as, one as, reason that when people say well now what is your name and i say elizabeth just elizabeth <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, it has been delightful having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for making some time to join with us and tell us all about the Rebecca's. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm always delighted to talk about Rebecca's. Excellent. Well, thank awesome. you so much. Goodbye, everybody.